Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for a webinar on next generation diabetes management. Diabetes is one of the most common chronic conditions in the US impacting approximately 10% of the population and is often associated with other comorbid conditions. I'd like to welcome Dr. Mark Clements and Dr. Ed Nakeza from our partner Gluco to discuss their research in this space and how Gluco improves diabetes management. Dr. Clements is the Chief Medical Officer of Glucose since 2019 and previously served on Glucose Medical Advisory Board. Independently, he is a professor of pediatrics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and holds the Rick and Kathy Bayer Family Endowed Chair in Endocrinology. He has dedicated his career to improving the lives of those with diabetes and has co-authored or authored more than 80 diabetes-related research articles. Dr. Nikeza is a practicing data scientist and Glucose VP of Data Science and Clinical Research. He holds an MS and PhD in acoustics from Penn State. His 20-year research career spans the full gamut of basic to applied research, including over 100 scientific presentations and published papers. About five years ago, Ed pivoted his career into med tech to accelerate technology and make diabetes data more accessible actionable and meaningful for those living with chronic conditions. Mark and Ed, we are excited to have you with us today. Thanks, Sue. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, Mark and I are super excited to be with you and the Datavant uh, partners today. Uh, given that Mark and I are researchers, we thought we'd treat this session as more of a learning session. We'll cover Diabetes 101, Gluco products, our values, and our near and long-term vision. We'll get into some of the nerdy details of our data sets and data types. We have millions of user data sets that we can share, including high resolution longitudinal data sets that span years for many individuals. We'll give you an honest assessment of the data we currently have, what is on our roadmap, and what signals and contexts are missing. We wanna treat this session as a brainstorming session, We'd love to get everyone thinking about how combining our data with their data or another Datavance partner's data can be a win. And when I say win, I mean filling in the missing signals, the context and the outcomes is a win for the diabetes community through the acceleration of technology. Our talk contains three parts. In part one, we'll cover the why, what, and how. In part two, we'll get into the data and what's possible when we combine our data with the data in the Datavant ecosystem. We'll also leave some time at the end for questions and encourage you to put any questions in the Q&A during the session. All right, so let's dive in. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I've been a data-driven researcher my whole career. I spent the first 15 years of my career at a government research laboratory studying outdoor sound environments with continuously running noise monitors and the human perception of sound. What a lot of people don't know about me though, is that 12 years ago, my daughter Leah was diagnosed with type one diabetes. Uh, this was a big driver when I decided to pivot my career about five years ago into the diabetes tech space. So in addition to being a researcher and data scientist, I am also the dad of Leah, who lives with diabetes. Here's a picture of us in the hospital at the time around her diagnosis. Now I'm not gonna lie to you, the months and years that followed my daughter's diagnosis were rough on me and my family. For one, we didn't have the technology we have today. In general, it was a time of being sleep deprived, a time of being worried and fearful that her blood glucose levels would go too low uh, during the middle of the night resulting in coma or death or that her BGs would be too high for too long, resulting in long-term complications. I apologize for being dramatic, but it's important for me to let you know why I'm here. As a data scientist and the dad of Leah, I think there's a real opportunity to use data to improve the lives of those living with diabetes and other chronic conditions. On a positive note, I can tell you that Leah is a happy and healthy 17-year-old. And on another positive note, I've had the privilege of working with some of the world's most amazing endocrinologists, uh, such as my colleague, Dr. Mark Clements. And with that, Mark, why don't you take over? 
Thanks, Ed. Uh, thanks for telling us how you became interested in helping uh, those with diabetes and uh, other conditions. So you all just heard a few moments ago uh, that I'm a physician and a diabetes researcher. And that partly explains why I'm at Gluco and why I'm speaking to you today. But I'm also here because like you, I'm simply an empathetic human being. Uh, one cannot sit in a room and listen to the stories that people with diabetes tell about the burden of this disease and not immediately feel a sense of concern and injustice at the unfairness of it all. Uh, constant daily decisions to care for the disease uh, without any hope for a break, unexpected visits to the emergency room, even near-death experiences from seriously low blood sugars. There are tears. There's also room though for hope. So uh, we can reduce the burden of this disease. And that leads me to why we're here today. The reason why we're here is to accelerate innovation. That's why we gluco. Um, in fact, we see this as a win-win situation. Getting our data into the hands of as many people as possible is not only a win for my patients or, or for Ed's daughter, Leah, uh, for adults with diabetes or for providers and researchers like me, but it's also a win for the entire diabetes ecosystem. Connecting diabetes data, such as the data that we have at Gluco, uh, with other data sources, like those provided on the data van ecosystem, can provide missing context and outcomes uh, to develop that next generation of insights and algorithms that we really need to reduce the burden of the disease. So uh, let's jump into Diabetes 101. Uh, I'd first like to make sure that everyone in the audience understands the basics about diabetes. So I'll uh, share just a few things to level set our audience. The first is to remind you about the difference between type one and type two diabetes. Remember that type one diabetes is caused by low insulin production. Type one is an autoimmune disease in which the immune system attacks the cells that make insulin, reducing the number of functional cells. In contrast, type two diabetes often involves higher production of insulin. The problem is that the body's tissues stop listening to the insulin, which acts as a sort of uh, key to unlock the door to each cell, allowing sugars to enter the cell to be burned as fuel. When that lock gets jammed, the door does not open. The body tries to make more insulin to compensate, but eventually those cells just can't keep up and blood sugar levels rise. So next, next let's talk about why uh, we care about keeping blood sugar levels normal. We're first worried about uh, long-term complications related to high blood sugar levels. In clinic, we usually measure average blood sugar control through a simple blood test called the hemoglobin A1C. Many studies have suggested that when once A1C remains high for a long time, the small blood vessels can be altered, causing microvascular disease. So this can lead to eye disease, kidney disease, and disease of the long nerves, especially in the legs. It can also cause macrovascular disease or large blood vessel disease, which can lead to heart disease, uh, stroke, and uh, peripheral vascular disease or low circulation to the lower legs. Next, we're also worried about the immediate complications of diabetes. Insulin and oral medications to treat blood sugar levels can be dangerous. If one takes too much insulin or is on multiple oral medicines for diabetes, this can lead to low blood sugar levels, which can be associated with seizures, unconsciousness, or in extreme cases, death. And if one doesn't take enough insulin or oral medications to treat diabetes, one can experience high blood sugars or a complication called ketoacidosis, which can be associated with hospitalization, brain swelling, and in some cases, death. Two of our major treatment goals are to avoid both the um, long and short-term consequences of uh, uncontrolled blood sugars. Finally, a major goal of treatment is to maximize quality of life for these individuals. Here I'm showing you Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. If one cannot fulfill the basic goals of maintaining normal physiology and achieving safety and security, one's quality of life begins to decline. Of course, for many of us in the 21st century, 
we've begun to wrestle with the notion that uh, Wi-Fi and 5G belong on Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. But I want to emphasize that persons with diabetes are still wrestling with the, mo the two most basic needs on the next slide, which are basic physiology and safety and security. Next slide. So how do people uh, achieve their treatment goals with diabetes? Well, they do so by engaging with these seven pillars of diabetes self-management. For instance, persons with diabetes may have to take insulin or other medication multiple times every day. They may have to monitor their blood glucose levels multiple times a day, remain physically active, and maintain a healthy diet along with carbohydrate counting. I want you to remember that the burden of clinical care for diabetes is immense. Uh, this is one of the most complicated chronic diseases to manage. So people with diabetes may have to attend four clinic visits a year, which can involve taking a half day out of their lives. They have to get poked and prodded for various laboratory tests and eye exams. They may have to plan and organize refills for more than a half a dozen prescriptions every year. They have to share their blood sugar data their insulin, food, and exercise data with their healthcare team if they want help from that team in between clinic visits. And uh, if the burden of clinical management isn't great enough, the burden of self-management, the actions they have to take on their own every day are even greater. Uh, these individuals have to make up to 180 extra decisions every day about the disease and how to treat it. We don't usually have to make those kinds of decisions. And they may have to wear certain devices like a continuous glucose monitor or an insulin pump on their skin, or they may have to carry around a backpack with various supplies like a glucose meter, uh, insulin pens, uh, snacks to treat uh, low blood sugar. If you don't believe that uh, the burden of this disease is great uh, and very disruptive to daily life, I would encourage you to try setting an alarm tomorrow. Uh, to just remind you to take a simple action like signing your name on a piece of paper 18 times uh, between the time you wake up and the time you go to bed. And then I think you will experience just a fraction of the burden these individuals face. Yeah, that, that's a really great uh, exercise, Mark. And, and thank you for the overview. Uh, now let's uh, chat a little bit about uh, the gluco products. So uh, when we think about uh, gluco uh, we can think about us in, in several different ways. For one, we have over 32 billion uh, data points, um, 3.4 million patients uh, that are within 7,500 uh, different clinics in 29 countries, and our product is in uh, 22 uh, different languages. Uh, one of the things I love and my daughter loves about Gluco is that we are device agnostic. If you have a preference for the type of uh, glucose meter, insulin pump, fitness tracker, we'll likely be able to support those devices given that we support over 95% of all the diabetes and fitness devices on the market. Uh, we serve those living with diabetes and their families and caretakers, and we provide our mobile and web application to them uh, for free. Uh, we also serve uh, providers and clinics. And we have a wide range of tools, reports, and insights that we deliver through our web application. One of our differentiators is the fact that we sit between both the patient and the provider. And we design our solutions and insights for both of these uh, user groups. We also, uh, another differentiator uh, from, from other uh, companies is that we've actually taken the time to do randomized clinical trials um, on our platform. So here we can see that those folks enrolled in one of our remote patient monitoring programs, if you see the red dots listed as RPM, have statistically significant drops in their A1Cs after three and six months in comparison to the, the control group. And then lastly, we really um, try to make collecting data easy. One of our North stars here at Gluco is passive data collection. We aim to reduce the burden associated with chronic conditions. And as a result, we make collecting data just as, as easy as it can, can be. Um, 
We can do that either in the clinic via one of our transmitters, or it could be done through our mobile app, and in many cases can be synced automatically through a Bluetooth uh, connection. All right, uh, so we made it to part two. Let's now jump in and uh, talk about our data. So in addition to the typical types of demographic information you'd expect uh, to be collected by a company such as ours, we also capture the diabetes type. Uh, approximately 80% of our data is from those living with type one diabetes. Uh, though over the past few years, we've seen a significant increase in the number of our users that uh, have type two diabetes, uh, approximately 10% of our data currently, but those numbers are uh, constantly growing and changing. Uh, in addition, uh, we also have uh, users with gestational and pre-diabetes. Uh, as we kind of jump into the, the main data types at Gluco, I thought I'd start with kind of the essential data types, uh, focusing here on type 1 diabetes, uh, just to kind of level set everyone. So here we can see the, the main data types are glucose, uh, carb, and insulin data, such as basal and bolus insulin. We support a ton of different uh, glucometers and refer to this data as self-monitored blood glucose data, SMBG. Uh, this data is captured when a person with diabetes does a finger prick and puts that blood, blood droplet into a strip which is read by the glucometer. Glucometers are great for getting a snapshot of a person's BG level, uh, but it really only tells uh, part of the story. So if I focus you on these four dots here, uh, this is over a 24 hour time period. You can see we get a snapshot of where this person's uh, blood sugar is at, uh, at at these four time points. But with the advent of the continuous glucose uh, monitor, uh, we get a better picture of the story. Uh, this was really a game changer for me and my family. So instead of having to get up in the middle of the night uh, to prick my daughter's finger and check her blood uh, glucose level, we could now see what her level is at any time during the day. We have over 100,000 users on our platform that use CGMs uh, currently. And then going back to the story I started telling about uh, Leah, my daughter, uh, th this chart here also tells a story with uh, CGM data. And what we're really looking at here might be a little deceptive, but it's really five years of CGM data. Uh, the arrows here represent some of the transition points uh, where we've adopted new technologies. And so each of these data points represents uh, an entire year's worth of information. And we do a rolling average and we can see that we are heading in, in the right direction here and that the yearly time and range is, is heading in the right direction. And, and again, for those of you who may be more familiar with A1C, uh, down here uh, when in 2016 and 15, uh, when this data was collected, Leah's A1C was in the range of like eight to nine, and then uh, currently is in the range of like six to seven. So very significant improvements uh, over the years. And the, the CGM data helps really tell that story. Uh, another important data type is insulin data. We capture the data from insulin pumps and are planning to add data from multiple smart pens and, and pen caps. The two main types of insulin data are bolus or one-time injections of insulin to cover food that is eaten or uh, to correct high blood glucose levels. Uh, basal insulin is a small dose of insulin that is delivered at a constant rate. If you look at the units, it's in units per hour here. And you can see in this example, uh, the, this user's basal rate was set to 0 0.5 units per hour. And then that changes around two in the morning to five in, in the morning to 0 0.7 uh, units per hour. The last piece of essential type one diabetes data is carb data. Here you can see the different types, uh, the, the different carbohydrate amounts uh, across the day, given the numbers uh, here. Uh, and then uh, the, the filled in green boxes, uh, as we start to look at all of the data together, it, it tells a story, right? So looking at the, the carbohydrate data, uh, we can see here that uh, the filled in green 
boxes correspond to when insulin was delivered and the unfilled green boxes are just carbohydrate amounts that are not associated with, with insulin. And then again, just painting the story, um, remember without the CGM, we wouldn't know that the blood sugar uh, actually goes low around two in the morning. And then here you could see the 20 grams of, of rescue carbs. And so for um, somebody living with uh, this uh, uh, disease or somebody caring for someone who living with this disease, this, this information is very, very helpful. Um, so that was just kind of the essentials, but at, at Gluco, uh, we capture a, a lot more data. Uh, so in addition to uh, carbohydrate information, we also capture very detailed food information. This feature is linked to a comprehensive food database with millions of grocery and restaurant uh, foods that the user can input through our mobile device. In addition to food uh, logging and that capability, we also capture data from activity trackers, uh, medications. Uh, we know that the different types of insulins uh, and other medications uh, people are on and also support uh, connected scales and connected blood pressure cups. All right, so this is uh, what I consider uh, the, the fun part of the talk, right? So now let's kind of talk about what's possible with uh, glucose data. Uh, so um, what I'm showing here are uh, short-term insights. So this is over a 24-hour period, and they can really provide in the moment and real-time opportunities to encourage change or cl clinical support for the Gluco user. These 24-hour snapshots can help the user and healthcare provider see daily trends of what might be impacting their more global picture uh, of health here. Right, so you can see the essential data on top. Now we're adding in additional context with the meds activity, uh, the, the heart rate, the weight, and the, and the blood pressure. Uh, where things get really interesting is when we think about those uh, 24 hour insights and then aggregating them over uh, weeks and months and days. And so this slide represents the possible long-term insights that can be gleaned from, from this type of data. Uh, here we're showing yearly averages uh, for a variety of indicators of diabetes success. Yearly progress, monthly, or any time frame can actually be targeted uh, for evaluation. Uh, what we see here in these trends are health improvement marked by the color green. Uh, for this user, the shared goal between the healthcare provider and the Gluco user was a 5% loss in weight and an improvement in blood pressure without pharmaceutical treatment. A lighter green shows that the user was trending in a good direction, and the darker green represents hitting their goal and maintaining it. Increased exercise was part of the weight loss plan. So this data point along with the heart rate data show improved similar improvements. Uh, during the five year course, this Gluco user continued to experience poor thyroid function and was placed on a new med medication, which you can see is colored in yellow. Uh, th that shows a, a change in the medication, which could then uh, become a, a maintenance uh, medication moving forward. So these insights uh, help trigger a deeper dive into the data, uh, and we can look at predictors for uh, worsening thyroid disease or other co-occurring uh, conditions. Uh, next, let's just talk a little bit about our roadmap. And, and this is one of the parts that, that gets me really excited about working at Gluco. Here's a sneak peek at, at two new data types we are currently investigating. It's all about providing the missing context so that we can provide feedback and insights to both the user, that is the person living with the chronic condition, and those caring for the people who live with the chronic conditions. Knowing the location and the activity the person was doing throughout the day will enable us to provide just the right insight at just the right time. It will allow us to develop algorithms that can learn over time uh, and also learn what works for that particular individual. We're essentially working towards just the right feedback or nudge at just the right moment uh, with just the right tone. And we have a, a, a really great uh, user design team 
uh, and some behavioral psychologists uh, that I get the pleasure uh, to, to work with. Now, just in case I gave you the sense that uh, we have all of this solved, uh, I unfortunately want to um, call a reality check. So as um, uh, going to borrow a phrase from one of our friends uh, over at Diatribe, uh, we like to say there's at least 42 factors that uh, affect blood glucose. In other words, we still have more work to do uh, as we're still missing outcomes and context. And this is why we're super excited to partner with DataVant and, and the DataVant partners in, in ecosystem. Uh, Sue, I'll, I'll pass uh, this next section over to you. Thanks, Ed. So as Ed points out, there can be many different factors that affect blood glucose and many different data types that could be relevant when combined with glucose data for better understanding of how to manage diabetes and which patients may need more proactive support than others. However, healthcare data is fragmented with different data types and data elements held at disparate companies that interact with the patient throughout their journey. And given the heavily regulated nature of the industry, data sharing in healthcare brings a unique set of challenges around maintaining patient privacy and minimizing risk of any re-identification as more data is connected together. Reducing the friction of data sharing while also maintaining patient privacy is the problem that DataVance technology aims to solve. That starts first with de-identifying any personally identifiable information such as the data elements shown for this fictional patient, John Smith, here. DataVance software creates HIPAA-compliant patient tokens from elements like name, date of birth, gender, address, and other identifying info. These tokens are irreversible, and every organization that's running DataVance software also has a unique, specific encryption applied to their patient tokens which is why the organization on the left here creates patient 123 for John Smith and the organization on the right creates patient 456 for John Smith. It's only at the point when two organizations agree to establish a connection or a match, then DataVance software will apply a transformation to those tokens so that they conform and can be linked together. That's a critical part of our overall security infrastructure for our network at large. De-identification and tokenization is only the first step in the process of building a linked data set. Our platform reduces other frictions to data exchange um, so that we have features where you can find other partners who have relevant data on your patients through a process that we call overlap. Uh, DataVance platform can manage certification so that as you uh, link more and more data sets together, the certification process ensures that the linked data set still meets HIPAA expert determination standards for minimal re-identification risk of a particular patient. And ultimately our platform can also distribute linked data sets to any end, end environment where analytics uh, may be run. Of course, these tools for finding partners, conducting overlaps and linking data is really as, only as useful as the size of our overall partner network that uses the DataVant token. And our ecosystem is something that we're very proud of. We have the largest real world data partner ecosystem consisting of all the top 10 claims data partners, um, 2000 hospitals and 15,000 clinics that use data van tokenization. Uh, we have uh, the top lab providers in our network, both national reference labs, as well as specialty and esoteric labs. Uh, we have EHR data sources, mortality data, we have specialty pharmacy partners, health plans, and even non-traditional sources that are still relevant for healthcare research, such as consumer data sets and social determinants of health data sources. Through our ecosystem, we enabled glucose data to be linked to a partner that has claim and lab data. To enable a study uh, for a top 10 pharma company that was seeking to analyze the relationship between blood glucose data, A1C values, and time and range, um, and looking at those values as compared to a range of healthcare outcomes they were interested in. Given the size of the DataVant ecosystem, there are many possibilities for linking glucose data to other types of data for research. So, uh... 
with that, wh why don't we talk about the various opportunities that exist if glucose data uh, were to be combined with other kinds of data available through the data van ecosystem that uh, Sue so kindly told us about. This uh, also fits well with our roadmap as we start to support and take in data related to chronic conditions uh, that are comorbidities related to diabetes. So the first is that uh, grocery and retail prescription data uh, might be used for a variety of purposes, uh, including to understand the food habits of persons with diabetes, achieving various levels of uh, blood glucose control. Alternatively, grocery and prescription data might help to predict blood glucose control in diabetes. The same is true for medication monitoring and adherence or engagement data that might come from sources other than gluco. When combined with gluco data, these might be powerful tools to predict diabetes outcomes over months or even years. Consumer habits, uh, lifestyle, and behavior data are interesting because they might predict uh, diabetes outcomes, but the gluco data might also be helpful to understand consumer habits for persons with diabetes who meet various demographic criteria. Medical and prescription claims, when combined with gluco data, uh, you know, should have an obvious uh, value to everyone uh, on this uh, uh, webinar today. One could examine the costs of care or cost effectiveness of various clinical interventions across segments of the population based on glucose levels, time and range, device usage, or other factors. And then if one looks at EHR, uh, clinical data, uh, you know, these data might allow bi-directional prediction of diabetes outcomes when combined with the uh, various data available in a typical EHR, or allow the prediction of the outcomes of neighboring diseases with the detailed diabetes data that we have available on the GLUCO platform. Next, uh, patient reported outcomes may help to identify uh, uh, the mental health or behavioral correlates of diabetes outcomes, uh, or vice versa. One might find that uh, uh, certain characteristics of diabetes self-management are correlated with certain mental health outcomes. And then uh, finally, um, social determinants of health have really been gaining steam uh, in terms of uh, garnering interest uh, by uh, clinicians and researchers across uh, chronic care uh, disease management. And uh, social determinants of health could be used in a, in a similar way, right? Uh, one could use uh, these data collected on another platform to help predict diabetes outcomes, but one might also find that one could classify individuals with diabetes um, on the GLUCO platform um, by predicting uh, some of these social determinants of health. Great, thank you for walking through some of those proposed use cases, Mark, for the various data types that could be linked to glucose data. Um, obviously, many different directions that this can go, so we'd like to open it up for an audience poll. Would really like to hear from you guys, of these different data types that were mentioned, which do you think would be most valuable for filling in the missing context? And if you have an idea for data that would be uh, interesting link to glucose data that's not listed here, feel free to type it into the Q&A box. We'll give a couple seconds for uh, the audience members to vote. You can select multiple of these boxes and then we'll look at the results. All right, is that sufficient you think, Sue? For time? Yes, it'll close out at the preset uh, time. Okay. Sometimes with these multi selects, it uh, takes a bit of time for the, the back end to calculate the results. No problem. Uh, maybe just give me a thumbs up when you want me to move to the next slide. Sounds good. All right, the results are in. Um, looks like 38% of people who um, 
responded to the poll voted for EHR clinical data and social determinants of health um, and grocery consumer and medical claims also got over 30% votes. But interestingly, um, a lot of these votes are pretty evenly spread throughout. So I think the Gluco team has the, their work cut out for them to bring in all sorts of these uh, interesting data types. Thanks. Thanks to the audience for voting. Yeah, thanks. Um, so let's uh, just wrap up uh, before we get into to Q and A. Uh, so in summary, uh, well, first of all, uh, we hope you enjoyed our presentation today and learned a few things uh, about diabetes, our data, uh, the fact that we have high resolution longitudinal uh, data sets, uh, and that we, we really still have more work to do. Uh, again, if you, you know, we want to be a partner with good people and good companies that want to make a difference uh, to improve the lives of those living with, with chronic conditions. Uh, Mark and I would also like to thank our Gluco colleagues uh, that helped make this presentation possible. Uh, and we've also included a few references that we used uh, in the presentation. Uh, lastly, uh, I want to uh, point you to our, uh, our colleague, Kevin Dougherty. Um, if, uh, when you're interested in reaching out and learning more about uh, the data we have to offer or uh, about Glucose Clinical Research Platform, uh, please reach out to him. Uh, Kevin is fantastic and, and you'll be in good hands. And um, we're you know, really, really looking forward uh, to, to working with everyone. Great, so thank you, uh, Ed and Mark. At this point, we will open it up for audience Q&A. In order to submit a question, you'll see a little Q&A icon at the bottom right of your Zoom screen. Please feel free to type your question into that. All right, so we will get started with the first question that has come in. Uh, do you just have data using insulin on the platform or do you have data on patients with earlier stages of diabetes as well. Mark, you wanna take that one? Yeah, I'd be happy to answer. So on the Gluco platform in particular with the Gluco mobile application, uh, users can enter all of their diabetes uh, related medications uh, and, and they can also uh, tag other medications. It's also possible for a user uh, to enter each event of uh, taking a medication on a daily basis and to set reminders for taking those medications. So uh, we really can provide tracking uh, for medicines well beyond insulin for persons with prediabetes, uh, for, for persons uh, uh, with neighboring chronic conditions. Thanks, Mark. Another question is, does Gluco collect data on any other diseases besides diabetes? Go ahead, Mark. Sure, sure, I can take this one too. So, you know, uh, it is important to uh, remember earlier in the presentation, Ed showed uh, some of the devices uh, from which we can collect data. Uh, Gluco is connected to a number of uh, connected way scales and blood pressure cuffs. So you could imagine that, uh, again, in prediabetes, in hypertension, in other chronic diseases uh, for which monitoring blood pressure and weight are important, uh, we are already well equipped uh, uh, to uh, aid healthcare providers and healthcare provider teams in monitoring that disease. And uh, I think you're going to see that, uh, you know, our, our strategy really involves uh, continuing to grow in the direction of uh, neighboring conditions uh, to diabetes. So you'll only see the number of devices and the types of data that we can collect continue to grow. Uh, and, and then I, I would also uh, point out that uh, Gluco allows the collection of uh, physical activity data from a number of tracking devices that can collect accelerometer or heart rate data uh, onto the platform. And uh, you know, I can't think of a more fundamental type of data that is important to the monitoring of every single chronic disease uh, faced by humanity than uh, physical activity data, so. 
Great, thanks. Um, another question from the audience. Do you have data on the nutritional composition of food consumed by the patient? Yeah, yeah. Uh, great question. And uh, again, fits in with the theme of uh, the, the missing context. So, you know, as we went over kind of the fundamentals of uh, diabetes and diabetes data, we all often think about the, the carbohydrate uh, information. But anybody who's, um, you know, lives with that uh, chronic condition or cares for somebody knows that the composition of the food is really important and will affect uh, your blood glucose levels. Uh, so I'm happy to say that we do have data on the new nutritional uh, components uh, of food uh, on our platform. Uh, we use a uh, service for this. And with that, uh, we get detailed information uh, on over a, a million different types of foods that are in uh, both uh, the, the grocery store and, and uh, restaurants. Uh, that includes uh, calories, uh, the carbs, the fat, the protein, the serving size, uh, and also the, the source where the information came from. So uh, great question. Thanks, Ed. Um, question, in your research conducted on data collected in the Gluco platform, have there been any findings so far that have been surprising to either of you? Yeah, uh, Mark, I'll take this one first and then if, uh, if you have anything else to, to add in. Um, so uh, one of the things that we started looking into was um, the data that came in after the start of uh, the, the pandemic. And uh, one of the things we realized was that uh, as um, everybody was staying at home, this notion of uh, the types of patterns that we were seeing where uh, blood glucose levels uh, would be different between uh, during the, the week, uh, during the work week and during the weekend, uh, that actually flattened out uh, and went away. Uh, now, it kind of makes sense now, but um, you know, given that the pandemic uh, altered uh, the way that, that we lived, but uh, it was uh, surprising when we were first looking at the data. Uh, it wasn't until we dug in a little bit deeper uh, and we just realized, well, the, you know, things had, had changed. Very interesting. Okay, um, is there a model for academic researchers collaborating with you on research projects? Yeah, uh, the, there, there absolutely um, is. Um, so Mark, I'll, I'll take the first stab and again, uh, you know, have you uh, chime in. Uh, so we do have a, uh, a clinical research uh, platform um, and a product. Uh, so if you want to uh, conduct some research and you can use our platform to bring in that uh, diabetes data to, to support your study. Uh, we also uh, work with and collaborate with a, a lot of academic researchers that just want to use the real world data uh, in their studies. Um, and we, we're actively doing that and, and we encourage that. Uh, again, going back to our theme of win-win, uh, it really is kind of a win-win for uh, you know, the, the researcher and uh, the, the ecosystem and very much kind of fits in uh, where we're at. Uh, we also have a medical and scientific advisory board, uh, and we ask some of the, the prominent uh, physicians and academics to uh, directly collaborate and uh, guide us along the way. Mark, did I miss anything? Uh, no, no, I would just add to that, Ed, that, uh, you know, our medical and scientific advisory board is a little bit unique in that it is perhaps more expansive uh, than a lot of medical and scientific advisory boards. So, we really are looking for um, a legion of experts uh, in uh, their respective fields uh, who can, uh, you know, help us in an ad hoc manner. Um, you know, we're primarily uh, remote with this work um, to, you know, advise us as we have questions uh, uh, as we dive deeper into chronic disease. And uh, Ed's absolutely right. Some of these individuals. Um, you know, uh, can also serve as partners for us uh, because they are doing really innovative work 
and some of that innovative work may be of interest uh, to uh, Gluco as we continue to uh, expand our, our platform. So, so there are several avenues uh, for people to either use the Gluco platform um, uh, as a partner for their research or to partner in, uh, in research that uh, Gluco is interested in. Yeah, and I, I guess the last thing just to add, because um, I'll, I'll make the assumption that uh, maybe an academic researcher uh, asked that question. So please reach out to Kevin. Uh, Kevin will connect you with uh, the right folks uh, so we can start uh, collaborating together. Thank you. Um, another question from the audience is, are there any Medtronic or Tandem automated insulin delivery systems integrated into Gluco and what is planned for the future? Yeah, why don't you take that one, Mark? Sure. Uh, so we do have uh, the Tandem Control IQ system integrated onto the Gluco platform. Um, realize that integration happens uh, in multiple ways. Sometimes there, there's more than one avenue for a device uh, and its data to be shared with Gluco. Uh, we are on the long march along with all of the device manufacturers toward allowing data to be shared passively, uh, especially cloud to cloud. Uh, today, one can actually upload the um, tandem uh, control IQ pump uh, uh, through a uh, uh, Gluco transmitter or a Gluco uploader uh, that, that are provided. Uh, and uh, uh, the Medtronic device is uh, available on the Gluco platform in some markets uh, today. So similarly. Okay, any other questions from the audience? All right, I think that concludes our Q&A session. Um, Mark and Ed, any additional comments or color you wanna provide about, about Gluco or diabetes management? Um, I would just like to say uh, thanks, thanks for having us. Uh, we really value uh, our partnership and uh, you know, look, uh, look forward to uh, continued collaboration. Absolutely, and, and I would just put a call out to uh, all of those uh, companies and, and academic investigators out there who are thinking about interesting questions uh, to, to reach out. Uh, we're, we're open to conversations about what's possible. Great, thank you both. And thanks for being on the webinar. We appreciate the partnership with Gluco. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining today's webinar. Um, Ed and Mark from Gluco has shared some really interesting insights and um, given us a look into the future of the platform that you're building, which is very exciting. Uh, a recording of this webinar will be made available on the DataVant website in about a week. And um, please respond to the very short exit question as you leave this Zoom webinar. And I hope everybody has a great rest of your Wednesday.